so welcome to everyone who's joined us at the moment. Um, this is Breast Cancer Awareness, Screening Best Practice and Guidelines for Primary Care. Um, we will make a start to the webinar and um, if you have any questions throughout the session, I would ask that you pop it down into the chat um, section uh, and we'll pick them up as we go and answer at the end of the presentations during our question and answers um, section. Uh, we are joined today by uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Giles Davies, uh, who is a consultant, oncoplastic breast surgeon um, and breast specialist at One World Egg Women's Health. Um, Dr. Anmol Malotra, uh, who is consultant radiologist at One World Egg Women's Health. Um, Dr. Kestra Fauci Fernanda, please correct me if I'm wrong, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, consultant radiologist at One World Egg Women's Health. And Ms. Joanna Kelsey, who is our lead radiographer at One World Egg Women's Health. Um, we will be hearing a brief presentation from um, our consultants. Um, I will leave the floor for a moment to um, Ms. Joanna Kelsey, who will introduce herself, followed by um, Dr. Keshfra, um, and we will then carry on with the presentations. Hi, everybody, um, and welcome. It's nice to have you have you here. I'm Johanna Kelsey. I very, very excitingly um, have helped to set up the, the Breast Centre part of the uh, Women's Health um, Floor 6 at One Welbeck. And it's, it's been a very exciting time. So um, please ask any sort of, of the basic questions as in you know, times of opening and any, any queries that aren't answered by, um, by the presentations by Giles and, and Anmol, but always happy to help and answer phones and to answer any questions that you might have queries um, during the day when we're actually on site. So um, please, please enjoy and, and ask away at the end. Thank you. And um, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Kestra Sachdananda and I am a breast radiologist and I'm at Welbeck. It's one of the areas that we feel very passionately about and it's one where we want to present really good practice. Very happy to, to be here. Um, we are all screening background, so we're all very much part of the quality assured services that we do have for the NHS breast screening programme, of which I am one. Um, and I am specialised in breast screening radiology as well as symptomatic radiology. Very pleased to be here and supporting the team. Thank you very much to both. Um, I will hand over to Dr. Malotra, who will start with the presentation. So, uh, welcome everybody. And Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about um, One World Bet and what we're trying to achieve here. Um, I thought I would talk about how we are trying to optimize breast screening and what we should be aspiring to, not just at One World Bet, but everywhere. So this is a presentation about breast cancer and the screening of breast cancer and how we can improve that. So breast cancer, as we all know, is the most common cancer in the UK. It accounts for about 15% of all new cancer cases. That's about 55,000 cancers, breast cancers, every year in the UK, which amounts to 150 new cancers per year, per day, sorry. Um, currently, breast cancer mortality is driven by average risk. The screening is driven by average risk rather than those in the high risk category. And that's because the average risk woman it have far outnumbers those in the high risk category. The UN has a sustainability development goal, which it set out in 2015, where it wanted to reduce by one third premature mortality um, by non-communicable diseases if through prevention and treatment and promoting mental health and well-being. In 2020, in July, the UN high level political forum, which monitors this, said that the pandemic had already stalled progress made um, to date from 2018 to 2019. Some countries had even reversed their progress and health inequalities had widened both between countries and within countries and that included the UK. The WHO Global Breast Cancer Initiative wants to reduce breast cancer mortality by 2.5% per year globally. That would avert potentially 2.5 million breast cancer deaths between 2020 and 2040. That would, what, would, what they're trying to do is avert breast cancer deaths by 25% by 2030 and 40% by 2040. How are they proposing doing this? Well, they propose by health promotion for early detection and timely diagnosis and comprehensive breast cancer management. 
So those first two highlighted versions are where screening would come in. So the UK National Health Breast Screening Programme uses mammography. It's targeted at general risk high, uh, population which are with an 11% lifetime risk. Most breast cancers, as we know, occur after the age of 50. The radiation risk of mammograms, lots of women are worried about this, obviously. But we know that breast screening with mammograms saves lives. And that's why the screening program occurs between the ages of 50 and 70. We know that if we screen 100,000 women between the ages of 40 and 74, we could potentially cause 16 breast cancer deaths because of the radiation, and I'll come back to that in a second, but we would prevent 968 cancer deaths by screening that population. And that 16 breast cancer deaths is based on linear data from atomic data, not from the diagnostic level of radiation that we use. So most of us think that that even at 16 is a way overestimate of what we would induce by using radiation at diagnostic levels. We know that the more often we screen, the better the pickup rate and the better the more outcome mortality. So this is a chart which compares biannual screening, which is what most countries in the, in the world will use, as opposed to annual screening, which several countries will use. And this basically shows that the bigger your cohort, the better your mortality, and the more cancers you will say, the more cancer deaths you will save. And if you screen more often, i.e. annually, you will save more cancer deaths. This is the only kind of study that was done in the early 90s, a Concord study by Professor Coleman, um, which looked at countries on all five continents. It was, it was the first study that did that. And it's no coincidence, it's a very complicated slide, and I'm not going to go through all the data, but just to show that the first few countries on that data list, which have the best cancer survival rates, happen to be the ones that screen annually. I think that's just an interesting bit of data there. So mammographic screening. We know that those patients who, we, who, are per, who, occur, who attend screening, generally the cancers we detect will be small cancers, hopefully. Only 5% of those who attend screening will have large cancers which potentially have um, nodal disease. We also know that the cancers that occur between screening rounds are the, called the interval cancers, are the cancers we really want to detect. And those are the ones which are much more aggressive. And this slide basically shows that if you have an interval cancer, i.e. a cancer detected within one year of a normal screen, your mortality is higher than the general population if your cancer is detected between year one and two or one and three, you're, you have a significantly better outcome than those who have a cancer detected one year within a normal screen. And that's potentially because these cancers are more aggressive, faster growing cancers that might appear within one year of a normal screen. The Dutch data looked at screening again and showed that interval cancers, those that are presented with large cancers, was just under 20% um, as interval cancers. And those who present through the symptomatic population, there's a larger percentage will present with a larger tumor. And that's fairly stressed. Obvious if you screen for cancers, hopefully you're gonna pick up smaller cancers. So how do we reduce cancer deaths through imaging? We want to increase the screening uptake. It's really important that we get patients to screen. We want to reduce the interval between breast cancer screens, and we want to detect these cancers earlier. So why are mammograms less sensitive in some women? Well, we know that breast density has a significant impact on the sensitivity and specificity of a mammogram. And what is breast density? Well, breast density is something that's measured only on a mammogram. It doesn't matter how what the breast looks like or what it feels on a clinical examination. There are several classification models, but the most commonly used worldwide is called the BIRADS classification. And there are automated ways now available for measuring breast density. So it's not something the radiologist or the, or the surgeon determines, it's something a computer determines on based on what the mammogram looks like. And you get a, a number that pops, uh, sorry, a letter that pops up and tells you what the breast density is when you screen a patient with a mammogram at one well back. So the breast density is something like this, that a breast cancer is generally white 
And if you have a black background or fatty breast background, you're more likely to be able to see the breast cancer. As we go through the breast density, so B, C, and D, you can see that if you have a small white lesion on a white background, it becomes much harder to find. We know that half the population of screening age will be in, fall into that dense category, C and D, and half the population fall into a non-dense category, A and B. So we're more likely to miss bre small breast cancers in those who have dense breast tissue on mammography. So essentially, density reduces the sensitivity of a mammogram by masking. Here's an example where if you have a small cancer in a fatty breast, you're likely to see it. But that same cancer in the breast on the right-hand side, you just can't see it on a mammogram. We also know that breast density is an independent risk factor for breast cancer. We know that for every 1% of increase in density of the breast, you have a 2% increased lifetime risk of breast cancer. And we also know that women who work in an urban environment, such as London, have a higher incidence of having denser breast tissue. We know that we can reduce mortality in those with dense breasts if we do extra screening. But we also know that screening by itself without those extra screening means that those women who are turning up to screening with just mammography, the, the pickup rate is significantly lower than those who have fatty breast fatty tissue. So current practice in reporting. So the NHS BSP will just comment upon whether you have to be recalled or not recalled. It doesn't really look at density. Um, we have a BRAID trial that has just recently started, when I say recently, in the last month or two, um, at, most, at most national centers to look at that data about density of breast tissue and whether they should be adjunct screening methods and what those might be. But that data won't be available for at least several rounds. So we're talking about better part of six to seven to eight years before that data matures. We know that in symptomatic clinics, breast density is, is a variable com, um, in the radiology report. There's no standard. The UK doesn't have a standard report. We know in the US, 40, 46 out of 50 states now have some kind of legislation in place that breast density must be mentioned in the report. And in a lot of those states, they uh, are meant to tell um, the referring physician how they're meant to manage that. Most of Europe has screening with two-year two full field digital mammography between around the ages of 45 and 70. And several of these countries use ultrasound in dense breast tissue patients as part of that screening program now. The DENSE trial, which was published recently, has meant that they, in February of this year, the Dutch government has agreed to supplemental screening with MRI for those women who have extremely dense breast tissue. So those women who fall into the category D breast uh, density, the Dutch government has agreed because of the, the dense trial that they must have an MRI as a supplemental screen. So managing breast density, we know that if we add ultrasound to a patient who has a breast, the dense breast tissue, we can pick up another two to four breast, uh, breast cancers um, in addition, to, in 100,000 women, sorry, in 1,000 women um, screened. So normal screening will pick up about 8.7 cancers per 1,000. Adding ultrasound in these patients can pick up potentially another four cancers. Those four cancers that are picked up are the kind of cancers we actually need to find. They are the invasive cancers, they're early cancers, they're no negative cancers. 85% of those on ultrasound will be early cancers. But also, obviously, the more we screen with it, imaging modalities, we're more likely we're to find incidental findings, and therefore we will be biopsying more patients. And so that is something that patients need to be aware of and referring physicians. We know that from trials such as the Astound trial in Italy, that if you add digital tomography, you'll pick up more breast cancers, but it's the ultrasound which really picks up more cancers than even digital tomography. And we know that if you add ultrasound to a screening program, you can, for those people who have dense breast tissue, you can reduce the interval cancer rate to a similar level to those who have fatty breast, uh, fatty tissue. 
So potentially you're picking up all those, or not all, but a lot of those cancers, which you would potentially be missing because of the density of the breast tissue by simply adding ultrasound. And the JSTAR study from Japan has similar, similar data. So what are the recommendations? We at One World Beck are using 3D tomography because it is state of the art. It looks at the, the breast in slices rather than in 2D images. We are screening from the ages of 40 and onwards. Uh, we've introduced automated breast density measurements and assessments so that we know the computer tells us whether the patient has a dense breast or not. All those classifications are added to all our mammogram reports. And our job as today is to educate our patients, but also our referring clinicians about the importance of density in breast tissue. And we are recommending that patients in category C and D, dense breast tissue, have a, uh, an ultrasound in addition to their mammogram. We offer a walk-in service for women over the age of 40, so they can self-refer. We have an automated system, as I've said. We've added that to all our reports. Um, and this is the kind of um, schematic that we have, which basically laid out to all our clinicians as to how women who just present for a mammogram, how we should be managing them. So the, 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 the management is the same, whichever physician you might see. So what, what are the future possibilities of how to manage patients with dense breast tissue? Well, there is a thing called MRI, obviously, which the dense, dense trial says that if you use it in, dense, in women with category D density, it's helpful. There is a, but MRI obviously is expensive and takes a lot of time. There's a version called abbreviated MRI, which lasts only about six minutes, three to six minutes, and will pick up most of the breast cancers, if not all of the breast cancers, but that's still under evaluation worldwide. We know that if we, we can, with AI, potentially have risk profiling. So at One World Bank, we have the only 3D AI uh, software available, um, currently licensed, called ICAD. And we are using that in all our patients as a second read. So the computer generates information for us. It gives us a risk profile for the patient. Um, and we are buying the next generation, which is coming online early next year and has, has been validated now in studies, which actually gives us an independent risk factor for breast cancer as well. So the computer looks at all the pixels and through lots of back analysis will give us a risk profile for a patient. So when your patient turns up for a mammogram, they don't just get a report from a mammogram, they'll get a density assessment. And in the near future at One World Bank, we'll be able to offer them a risk profile measurement as well which is also puts them in the low, medium, and high categories. And those in the high categories, obviously, we would do supplemental screening for. Now, the com computer model will put some of those patients who have fatty breast density and, and density uh, A and B, will also put those in high categories. And that's because the computer somehow can pick up things that the art, human eye can't appreciate and potentially pick up breast cancers earlier than we can detect clinically. Um, and this, uh, and then, then we have to go and look for them. Well, now, whether we look for them with ultrasound or MRI depends on the patient and the profile of that patient. But it, give, it will be able to give us a personal risk score for each patient. Um, there's contrast enhanced mammography, which is still under evaluation, but seems promising as a adjunct to normal mammography. And then there's how we deliver this information. It will be delivered at One World Bank through consultants and possibly even through a, a specific breast care nurse and offer patients a personalized screening suggestion of how we, man how we manage their risk going forward. There is an elephant in the room I have not yet mentioned fully. I alluded to it earlier in the presentation and that's the pandemic, the effect on breast cancer effect on the pandemic. We know that there's a lot of undetected breast cancer out there. We know that there'll be a delayed diagnostic effect that uh, women will be pre uh, presenting with more advanced diseases because we're not screening as much, or we haven't screened over the last 18 months as much as we usually do. 
and that will have a knock-on predictable effect on survival and mortality. We know that that will have a knock-on effect onto the anxiety and stress for the women and for their families. There'll be obviously an economic impact of detecting cancers later, both personally to the patient, but also nationally to the country. As of January 21, we know that there was over a million women that had been delayed through breast screening. And at that time, about half a million of those patients had some active management. That means that they had some plan in order to get them screened at some point. And about 330,000 women were overdue an invitation, had not even been sent any kind of plan as to what to happen next. That was updated in June of this year. And we know that that number of just over a million had fallen to just under a million. And of the actively managed, that actually had fallen slightly to over 400,000 from over 500,000. And those with overdue invitations had increased rather than decreased. So when we look at the amount of breast cancers that we found, I'm sorry, this is blocking part of my slide, but we, we know that when we did how many cancers we detected in Q1 and Q2 of 2020 and 21 compared to 19 and 20, and 20 we know that in the previous years, we were detecting around six and a half thousand cancers through the screening program. And in the year of the pandemic, we, we found around about 1,500 cancers. So we are way behind on finding the smaller cancers earlier, and that will have a knock-on indication impact for all of us. I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Mr. Giles Davis, one of our consultant breast surgeons. Thank you, Anmol. Thank you, thank you. So the difference, I think, for One Welbeck, and I think for all of us as clinicians, is that we're now starting to really, really think about integrated women's health. And it's a startling fact that the average age of breast cancer patients that I treat and operate on is 48 years of age. Why is that? Because we're in London and we're seeing a skewed group of people, particularly in the independent sector. We're seeing young women who, uh, by default, are probably at high risk by having their children later. Patients who take health insurance uh, often actually have higher rates of family history of breast cancer. And we may well be screening an even more skewed cohort of people at higher risk of early breast cancer. And so not only is the screening important, but it's the whole package around breast awareness, uh, breast self-examination and modifying people's risk factors. So what I wanted to do tonight was to cover some really basic practical advice for you in primary care and take you through a process that I adopt in clinic with information provision that will hopefully uh, help guide you in referring and assessing patients. And then we're going to touch a little bit on the precision surgery that's coming forwards now with marker coil placements. So if I could have the first slide. So when we talk to patients about breast self-examination, I tend to do it in three ways, look, touch, and check. And I actually really, really reinforce the um, uh, looking side of things. I think people and doctors often ask, what should I be feeling for? What should I be feeling for? And actually, there are many patients who feel quite anxious about self-examination um, because they find things, and particularly um, women in their 40s, where they can be really quite nodular and lumpy at different times in their cycle. And I always say to the patient, just stop and look. Look for a contour change. Look for a subtle flattening. I often make the analogy, does it look a bit like cellulite, a bit rippled? And to do that with your arms by your side and above your head, and from looking from a slightly different angle. During the pandemic, I diagnosed four people with breast cancer over video consultation, and it was purely based on their description of what they thought it looked like. Obviously, I couldn't examine them. Someone said, I've got a bit of rippling, it's a bit stiff, my breast. And that was a very reliable sign for a subtle cancer. And in fact, when I did examine her, there wasn't actually a lot to feel apart from a firmness and asymmetric stiffness to the breast. 
We often say to the patients, perhaps use soapy water and you should use the flat of their hand, compressing their breasts against the chest wall rather than uh, the tips of their fingers where they often over find small nodular areas and it's quite difficult to discriminate. Can I have the next slide? So looking is really important. You're looking for a change in contour, you're looking for a retraction of the nipple. And really when people talk about nipple retraction, it's really actually quite common to have a slit like inverted nipple. And the process of aging of the milk ducts known as duct ectasia can lead to that gradual slit like nipple retraction. And that's actually quite a normal process, but very different from something concentrically pulling back on the nipple as though it's sunken in and held there. And again, that elevation of the arms above the head can often accentuate that tethering effect and nipple retraction. Up the next slide. So we talk about all of these areas. Is there a lump or swelling, a change in the skin, a change in color? It's amazing actually how common people think of inflammatory breast cancer as a diagnosis. Patients come in thinking they've got inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, a lot of GPs are worried that that's the diagnosis that they might miss. And actually inflammatory breast cancer is really, really quite unusual. And the commonest diagnosis of some subtle redness around the edge of the nipple is periductal mastitis. And when we go into the risk factors, it's really about thinking, putting that patient in their category of risk. So a young smoking patient with a red breast in one area is unlikely to have inflammatory breast cancer. A lady in her early 30s or mid 30s where the risk is starting to creep in, who's got a diffuse salmon pink tinge to her breast with some dermal edema in the lower part, it looks a little bit like that orange peel effect, then suddenly you think, hang on, that might be something significant. When we talk about nipple discharge, we really talk about single duct, spontaneous blood stain nipple discharge. And actually, again, it's not often blood as you would think of it. It's more a rusty colored dark fluid, it can be quite watery, and patients may not actually notice it apart from being a stain in their clothing or nightwear, having had compression in the night and something um, squeezing out. So yeah, next slide. So when we talk about referral, we talk about standard referral criteria. And of course, many of you will be used to using urgent two week suspected cancer referral templates. And of course, what we used to do, of course, was sort of triage patients according to whether they might be urgent or non-urgent in all NHS institutions now, everyone's seen quickly. Unfortunately, in the moment, it's really pressured. And so the discrimination between something that's urgent and non-urgent really shouldn't be there. And if a patient has reported themselves a new lump, I'd encourage you to refer them. The reason for that is if you don't refer them, Firstly, they won't have reassurance about the nature of that lump. Secondly, you're not going to have the luxury of at the moment of following them up or re-examining them easily in primary care, or even if they're imaged, sequentially imaging them um, you know, for, for, for follow-up in that way. So I think there's been a subtle shift right now at the moment to um, uh, investigating patients who present with lumps. So the threshold for imaging is, is lower um, and quite rightly so because we are seeing the missed cancers. Uh, next slide. When you talk about assessing risk and risk factors, um, there is a nice, and you can just click through on an interactive flow chart to the NICE guidance. And it's quite a useful desktop tab, tab to have or a bookmark to have on your um, web browser, just to kind of quickly flick through and think, oh yeah, how many family members? Is it first or second degree um, bilateral cancer, ovarian cancer, a man in the family with cancer? When should I refer to secondary care based on family history? As Amal has alluded to, we're starting to use breast density as the surrogate marker of risk. And actually, if you ask patients, another useful risk, risk factor is if they've had a previous biopsy. If a patient's had a previous benign biopsy, in many ways, that's a reflection, isn't it, of density. So fibroadenomatoid change, a fibroadenoma, 
And you'll often find that if someone's reporting having had a previous biopsy, that breast will actually come up dense on imaging. We know that postmenopausal obesity is a risk factor and an important one as well. Moderate alcohol intake. The HRT discussion and risk, I am going to cover a little bit tonight with some headline things. And I'm a, personally, I am very um, supportive of women um, taking HRT in a balanced way. And I think for too long, we've had very blanket and trigger discussion, uh, you know, well, no discussion, I think is the right word, of um, HRT in patients who've had early breast cancer. And I think that's going to change. And I also think that um, people are being... Um, denied uh, hormone replacement therapy choices and discussions ba based on family history. And that's another common, common one. So I want to kind of hopefully just cover a couple of things that will do that. So when we talk about age, that is, if you like, the most important risk factor. So it goes without saying there are clusters of conditions that we see that are linked really with the patient's age. So if you go to the youngest age group, if an 18 year old girl comes to you with a lump in her breast, it's really probably either going to be nothing. In other words, her dense breast tissue, an island of dense breast tissue. And you all know those ones where you think, is this a three centimeter mass or is in fact this just her asymmetry? And I'm, I, you know, I can't really evaluate that. And it always feels a bit sort of awkward, doesn't it, to sort of refer or, or and, and I'm in the same position as you, remember, I will examine that patient and think, well, either this is a three centimetre fibroadenoma or it's just her normal uh, benign breast change, which is asymmetric. So a juvenile fibroadenoma can be quite large. Um, cysts, we start to see uh, in your 20s and lymph nodes. And there has been, I'm afraid, a very uh, important confounding factor this year when it comes to cysts and lymph nodes, and that is COVID vaccination. So we're now starting to see a lot of patients who are pitching up four to six weeks following a vaccine with unilateral reactive lymphadenopathy. And it can be quite striking, uh, asymmetric, and even slightly uh, indeterminate on imaging. We, we tend to follow them up once with a, a further ultrasound to settle it, to watch it settle down. But we are seeing patients who have that reactive response to vaccination. We commonly see people with periodontal mastitis who are smokers. And those are the ones who also have greenish nipple discharge from both sides. And it is quite common, actually, to get eczema of the nipple, um, even at a young age. Always think about Paget's disease of the nipple, although it is very rare. I have seen it in women in their 30s occasionally. And there's a big difference, isn't there, to some scaling and sort of superficial crusting and something that is really like a persistent ulcer or a, you know, a surface wound that is something happening to the tip of the nipple. The, our bread and butter in the private sector, particularly at somewhere like One Welbeck, is the 40 to 50 year old age bracket. These are the people who are struggling at the moment. They're struggling because of um, menopausal symptoms. They're struggling because of work life balance. They're struggling with uh, long COVID. They're struggling with um, returning to work and financial pressures. And those are the people who need a holistic approach to women's health. I think really that's where Welbeck and other units, but particularly Welbeck, has really led the way in putting gynaecology and breast and women's health and a big investment in specialist nursing in all of those areas to try and counsel and shape women in a supportive way to look after their health in general. So I will routinely cover exercise, nutrition, stress and sleep hygiene with patients who come in that age group because these are all linked if you've got cysts it's often um, can be a reflection of balance you can improve some symptoms with lifestyle measures and it's important to talk about that as well as their underlying risk how often they should be screened and what strategies they can employ to get ready for any changes coming their way in terms of the menopause if you see someone with a very obvious 
short history of a large lump in their breast in their 40s, that is usually a cyst. Um, we see people with uh, bloodstained nipple discharge with papillomas, intraductal papillomas, which is actually more common than cancers bleeding from the nipple. And we, of course, we then start to see patients who are having mammography, uh, who are choosing to have mammography. And I think, again, we are seeing a skewed population. So if we see French patients or patients from Japan or from um, South America, they will expect to be screened from the age of 40. And of course, if you screen someone, you're going to see what they have. And if they have baseline calcification, we're going to interpret that. We are using tomosynthesis and we're using interventional biopsies like stereotactic biopsies to give people a comprehensive baseline assessment and reassurance there and then. When you get to around the age of 50, we're starting to uh, prick our ears up with symptomatic lumps that are persistent and asymmetric. And of course, right from 40 to even the 40 to 50 bracket, we will start to see palpable cancers appearing. I think if you, it goes without saying, if you saw a 70 year old with a lump in her breast uh, and it's new, your, you know, the diagnosis is breast cancer until proven otherwise. And so think about age as your big triage tool in terms of risk and think about the 40 to 50 year old uh, patient as a whole with regard to um, her symptoms and think of counseling them about the other stuff as well as just the breast self-examination. Do you have the next slide? So let's just define a few things, HRT and breast cancer. Young women who take HRT don't have a greater risk of breast cancer. If you're under 51, of course, what you're doing when you're having HRT is you're replacing the hormones that you've lost. Yeah? And the average age of the menopause is 51 years of age. So. When patients go through an early menopause, there are significant risks to that, principally cardiovascular in terms of excess death. And so for a young woman who's gone through an early-ish menopause in her early to mid forties, who's on HRT, they shouldn't be concerned about increasing their risk of breast cancer. Next slide. Women who've had a hysterectomy and take HRT don't have an increased risk of breast cancer. Numerous studies now have shown that women who take estrogen uh, only HRT uh, don't have a higher risk of breast cancer. It's the combined HRT, isn't it? And there's also no evidence that having a family history of breast cancer puts you at high risk of getting breast cancer if you take HRT. Yeah, you have to think about that one. Next slide. Now, of course, we see patients who we make menopausal by treating them for breast cancer. And uh, when we treat people for breast cancer, either giving them endocrine therapy, which does bring forward your menopause a little bit, tamoxifen, or chemotherapy particularly. So if you are 35 years of age and you have chemotherapy, you've got about a 60% chance of becoming menopausal. If you're 40, it's 80, 20, above that, it's pretty likely you'll be rendered menopausal by the treatment itself. So of course that treatment may stop your periods for a while and they might return, or it can be a permanent feature. So let's think about how we treat menopause for, for women who we make um, menopausal. Now there are some treatments that are slightly better than placebo. And I've put in the category things like acupuncture, um, St. John's Ward, and particularly things like cognitive behavioral therapy. And in fact, there is good evidence that CBT will improve your sleep, quality of life after six sessions. Um, and reaching for medication in menopause um, after breast cancer should be really something you get to after a really trying the other stuff. So exercise oncology, lifestyle medicine can really play a big role in the menopausal breast cancer patient. So when we see our patients at Wellbeck who are on our annual follow-up screens, we'll be asking them questions about their lifestyle and about their symptoms of the things that we've done to them. 
and we'll be talking about things related to lifestyle and um, supportive therapies. I hate the word complementary therapy. Can we have the next slide, please. Is it possible to get off of uh, my photos out of the, the uh, slides cut off? Oh, got it, got it, that's fine. So the other common symptoms that we see after breast cancer treatments are genital and urinary symptoms. And another common question that is asked at every talk we give is around topical estrogen and ER positive breast cancers. So if you've got an ER positive breast cancer, again, it's about having a ladder of uh, care and of treatment where we think about um, uh, giving them simple uh, advice initially and then escalating if their symptoms don't work. You will have seen in the news recently uh, a clinical trial that doesn't seem to show any benefit of laser-based therapy for the treatment of uh, vaginal symptoms. And I think those sorts of clinical trials are actually quite hard to do and quite hard to um, get results for. And that's an important finding. So we start with gentle emollient washes. There's no evidence that topical vaginal estrogen will increase your risk of recurrence of cancer, even if it's ER positive. Vaginal estrogen can be given via a pessary like Vagifem daily for two to three weeks. Um, you can have um, Interosa, which contains the precursor DHEA, which once inside will be converted to estrogen and testosterone. Um, you can have a cream or a ring. Uh, and so there are a lot of um, simple options and topical estrogens that are uh, available to patients who've had early breast cancer. These patients are living with the side effects of their treatment. And we often used to not really talk about it and not bring it into the conversation, but integrated women's health should be about addressing these issues at routine appointments at One Wellbeing. Can we the next slide? So there's no real evidence that you increase, um, HRT increases your risk of DCIS above the risk already there. It obviously doesn't um, seem to increase your risk of ER negative breast cancers. And it's really, if you've had an ER positive breast cancer, you've got to really think about when that was, um, how long has it been since that diagnosis before prescribing HRT. HRT after breast cancer is a discussion. All too often, actually, there is just no discussion at all. So if I've got a patient who's five years out, from a grade one lymph node negative breast cancer, I and they are brutally suffering with menopause affecting their lifestyle, work relationships, et cetera, then I certainly support them in considering a short uh, course of transdermal HRT, uh, using it in a way that the, achieves the lowest possible dose with the best delivery mechanism. And I think it's really important that we don't block these discussions from our patients. On the next slide. So um, breast cancer treatment is changing and it's changing at this earlier stage. So animals talked about tomosynthesis and ultrasound and finding small and early cancers. But of course, when we find small and early cancers, are we over treating them? And are we doing too much to patients that would have never died from breast cancer. One of the big debates is, of course, if you screen from 40, are you just finding cancers a bit earlier, this sort of lead time bias that would have been found anyway, and the intervention doesn't change the outcome. I think for many patients, actually, they accept the concept of over-investigation, but rather be, you know, careful um, and sure, but they, but they don't want to be over-treated. And breast cancer, ductal cancer is the commonest type, the milk ducts, will start with hyperplasia, which will then turn to atypical ductal hyperplasia. And if we find atypical ductal hyperplasia on a biopsy from screening, that's increasing their risk of future breast cancer by threefold. And then we go into ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS. DCIS can be graded low, intermediate, or high. And it's this area of diagnosis in early cancer, where a lot of research is going into avoiding uh, radiotherapy 
and perhaps even avoiding surgery, particularly in older patients, where the natural history and course would be so long that this would never become a problem. So it's more important than ever to avoid excessive surgery in patients with early breast cancer diagnoses. Next slide. So what we used to do um, routinely was someone will have a patch of calcification. They would have a stereotactic biopsy of the calcification. It would show something, some atypical ductal hyperplasia, a little bit of something, um, lots of long words, columnar cell change with atypia, flat epithelial and atypia. And at that point, they would be sent to me and we would have to do an operation to find out what it really was. Now, Admiral will be doing all of that business at his end of the clinic, and that's uh, vacuum-based biopsies, which take a larger sample of tissue um, that allow, uh, reduce the chances of an upgrade after a surgical procedure. And if you like, we are really performing therapeutic biopsies for small areas of calcification, avoiding unnecessary surgery. By taking more with a vacuum-based biopsy, we can actually make the right diagnosis at baseline, avoid an operation to make the diagnosis, and give people much better information about risk and screening in the future. And when we do these biopsies, we leave behind little marker coils. And the era of coil development has really changed quite quickly over the last three to five years, and we've actually avoid uh, going now to avoiding the use of what's shown in this picture, the wire, the wire localization. And the coils that we now have available can be magnetic um, uh, or they can be used uh, using radar based technology. The next slide. So this is a, uh, on the right hand side, a, a typical patient who has had what we call bracketing wires. She's had two wires put in her breast one uh, you can see above the other, and they're designed to mark the area uh, uh, to remove at surgery. So you can imagine that's quite a sort of, not a clumsy procedure, but it involves uh, quite a lot of local anesthetic and discomfort and these things hanging out of your breast on the morning of your operation, all bundled up with a big bandage. These wires can move around. And of course, when you do an operation, you're then committed to making an incision around the edge of the nipple and traveling all the way over to those wires to release them and deliver them into the wound. Now those wires, where they're going in, is not where the uh, area of concern is. And to place a wire, sometimes you need to place the wire from some distance away to be able to leave it stereotactically in the right position. So it adds a huge amount of tissue dissection to the operation to sort of get, get the wire delivered. And then if it's pulling out in your hand, you've lost the position of, the, of, the, uh, of where it ends up. You then have to send that piece of tissue with the wire poking out of it off to the x-ray department to see whether you've got the right area waiting for the x-ray on the screen to appear. And you may find that it's, um, it's near the edge of where you've cut and you've got to take a little bit more tissue. And so the era of deploying a little bit of metal and then using hook wires to localize tumors is changing. And we're moving to coils that we can find precisely with probes. So we have the next slide. So, and I don't know whether you'll be able to play this, you probably won't, but this is the um, Saviscout probe. Um, and it is a um, radar-based probe that allows me to find a marker coil, the Saviscout marker coil that AMA will deploy in a tumor or area of uh, disease to within one millimeter of accuracy. Let's have the next slide. So the beauty of, the beauty of these coils, uh, particularly the Scout coil, is that it um, doesn't interfere with any imaging. They're licensed for long-term implantable use. So we uh, can have a patient where at the diagnosis of their breast cancer, they can have one of these marker coils put in the tumor, then have chemotherapy treatment to uh, eliminate the cancer, followed by a small operation to remove the scalp coil with margins as a day case procedure. And really that's really typically what we would do now. 
And it looks a little bit like a mini space station. Um, it's got a little reflector wings on it. Uh, it's very easily deployed and can be left in during the chemotherapy treatment, which allows you to disconnect the radiology and surgery. So when the patient comes in for their operation, they're not going to the x-ray department having wires put in and waiting around and going home and then coming back. They are literally coming in and having the operation. And that's what I'm doing on Monday morning. So let's have another next slide. The beauty of it is, of course, it allows you to have 360 degree detection regardless of the relationship between the guide and the reflector. And what that means in practice is that I'm able to assess the margins. In other words, how far away I'm cutting from the edge of the, uh, of the center of the tumor where the marker coil is before I've even removed any tissue. It also allows me to place an incision that gives me the shortest distance from the skin to the tissue. Uh, I don't have to over dissect to deliver any wires. And I think it minimizes bruising, operation time, uh, allows much more precision surgery and has um, been a game changer for us in clinical practice. I'll give you an example. Um, Natasha was 27 years of age and she was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer in November 2020. She had chemotherapy and uh, animal chemi put in a marker, a Savis scout marker coil. And at the end of her chemotherapy, the tumor had gone uh, as it, we would have hoped because it's uh, triple negative responds very exquisitely to chemotherapy. And we were able to do the lymph node test, the sentinel node, and remove the tumor bed from a single incision in the armpit. Now, if you're a 27 year old who's just about to get married and you're a primary school teacher, that's a good outcome because she's not got a breast scar. And so the scalp really was, came into its own in that particular case and has really been of a lot of value to us. Next slide. It's quite nice for, uh, if you've got a very large breast, here's a lady uh, from Nigeria with two coils. Uh, she's got one in the, a small tumor in the upper inner quadrant and another tumor in the auxiliary tail. And you can find both of those large targets, uh, small targets in the large breast and remove them very precisely without carving out big bits of um, her breast. Next slide. There's a close up of a Savis scout coil with the little stellate distortion around it. And that you can see that specimen, that surgical specimen is actually quite small. Um, uh, and that has uh, reduced our specimen size as we're much, much more precise, minimizing the cosmetic defect in the patient. Is there another slide? No. So I'm gonna stop there. So just to summarize what I've discussed, I've talked about breast self-examination. I've talked about using lifestyle medicine approaches to um, uh, giving women in their 40s and 50s health advice and optimizing their health around nutrition, exercise, sleep, and stress. We talked about tomosynthesis imaging and the addition of ultrasound and how we tailor that in that catchment group that we commonly see at Welbeck uh, to try and pick up the early cancers, which is evidenced by our average uh, cancer uh, treatment age of 48 years of age. We talked a little bit about HRT and how it is a, a discussion always in patients, but a very um, a balanced discussion in someone who's had an ER positive breast cancer. And we've talked about precision uh, surgery using Saviscount coil placements, which is something that Am Alive have sort of taken the lead on in London and is, I think, of benefit to the patients. So thank you for your attention and we'll take some questions. Thank you very much to you both. Um, I will just start with the spotlighting of all of you so everyone's visible. There you go. Right, so we have a, a question from the audience, um, which is which machine should be used for screening? Um, we have a few patients in a row with suspicious scans and turns out to be nothing. Um, well, do you want to answer that one? Sure, I'll take that, yeah. Um, so one of the reasons that people get called back is for overlapping tissue. Um, you see a distortion or you see some tissue on a 2D image. Um, we know that if we use 3D imaging, like as we do at One Wellbeck, 
we're going to reduce the number of recalls. So by using 3D imaging, we're hopefully going to reduce that number that we will be coming back because when they come back with a 2D image, what do we do? We do a 3D image as a standard. So if we're doing 3D imaging up front, then that reduces the number of patients who come back and that's what we're doing. And so um, at One World Back, the 3D imaging that we have is state of the art, it's the newest machine available. People are worried about the potential radiation dose of doing a 3D image rather than a 2D image. Well, let me re reassure you, our physicists tell us that the 3D image on average is about 5% more than a normal 2D mammogram. So it's almost the same now. The, the technology has moved on. Initially, when 3D imaging came out, it was about 1.8 times the dose of a normal mammogram. And it's now been brought down to almost the same as a normal 2D mammogram for all the benefits that you get from doing a 3D mammogram. So we have the state-of-the-art mammography, which has the smallest detectors so that we can pick up the finest detail. Um, and um, by using 3D imaging up front, hopefully we have a smaller recall rate for distortions or for overlapping tissue, but we're calling patients back that actually need to be called back. Yeah, I think, can I make a comment as well? I think that the key with um, with all of that is is relates to, you know, one-stop breast clinics as well, because the, the issues that women have when they have a, just a mammogram ordered for them, um, is if they, if they don't have the results instantly in that whole risk stratification, they can sometimes be left uh, or you're left with a report showing an asymmetric density, M3. If the patient sees that report and thinks, well, I've got cancer, haven't I? You're uncertain, they're uncertain. And so it's about putting it all together in a one-stop package. And I think really any patient who has access to uh, self-directed self screening will be attending, uh, generally speaking, alongside symptomatic clinics. And so we will often pick up a patient who, uh, if something's found, where we'll say, look, actually, you know, do you, it might be appropriate for you to actually be seen now because th this has shown something, but they're not leaving just with a report um, or um, getting, you know, getting a report in the post showing saying there's a density. It's about completing that triple assessment uh, in all patients um, who attend for the first time. Thank you. I'll just um, carry on with the next one, if that's OK. Um, this one's from Niki, who actually just had to um, leave us for another meeting. But um, if, a sim if a patient is non-symptomatic, um, can they have the breast diagnostic as a preventative measure? Are you concerned around family history or breast, uh, breast cancers? Which I think Johanna will be most fitted to answer. Yes, yes. So we accept this is what we're trying to really, um, you know, get out there to everybody that people can self-refer from 40 years and upwards. Um, I've, I've trained the admin team very well when they call into the centre anyway to go through a whole list of questions. But it's patients who are non-symptomatic, so asymptomatic, can self-refer for a mammogram when they are 40 years and upwards and, and then they can come to the centre and that's when I will give them you know a whole load of information that both Giles and Anne Moll have, have passed on to us today about you know self-awareness self-checking you know um, what to look for how to check because a lot of ladies don't know that um, you know I, I say look in a mirror you know because they, they're never sure just putting it into their everyday way of life sort of thing of of checking themselves but you know I give them a really good um, sort of 30 minute appointment time where you know they can ask all sorts of questions and I do get all sorts of questions and it's that that forum for that lady to have that individual care and then as as Giles was saying if anything is found um, you know when our radiologist uh, views the images then we can offer what else is required as well you know hopefully in that same in that same visit. Yeah very much so I mean we've had um, it's interesting actually it's it's because it, of the way it's integrated and it's unusual to see women coming in and who then say, because often the people are quite, have been quite frightened about going to hospitals um, during the pandemic. And for some people, it's their first foray out into society. And when they come and say, well, actually, I'm overdue my smear as well. Is that something mm -hmm. that you can do? And then, you know, it's about tying up those loose ends because all too often, actually, if you have corporate health screens, for example, you might leave a health screen with a skin referral, a gynae referral, and a breast referral all clutched in your hand, and nobody is actually joining those things up. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but because they're linked, if you've got cysts and you're not sleeping, you're getting migraines and you're 46 and your breast, uh, one side hurts much more than the other and you've got reactive lymph nodes and your COVID vaccine, you know, it, it, it's, it's often, it's not just having the mammogram, is it? It's mm -hmm. about how do I go forwards and what yeah. is going to happen Absolutely. over the next It's week? about integrated care and that's yeah. something obviously in One World Bank we're trying to do with women's health care on one floor. So gynecological care as well as breast care, all on the same floor, all of us communicating in real time and having the ability to just have that conversation with the patient present and the patient knowing that we're talking to each other about her health care. Mm. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Uh, we have one more question from um, Chancho Chakraborty, sorry. Um, what is or was a frozen section? Um, I can actually give you um, the ability to talk if you'd like, um, just to explain your question, if you would. Yes, it was just uh, when you mentioned earlier on, Mr. Uh, Davis, about yeah. Yeah. to show the end of a wire, the extent of the X-ray department. That's right. Just, yeah. just brought that to mind. Yeah, no, I, I, it's a good question because, you know, it's kind of full change. So what you would do historically is you'd be doing those operations to find out what was wrong. And, you know, as a junior doctor, we'd even proceed during the surgery to something else if, if it was... Malignant, so a patient who woke, woke up with a surgical drain knew immediately that she had cancer because you'd obviously gone and taken the lymph nodes out because you found out it was cancer during the operation. That's, of course, has gone. And this is where vacuum based biopsy and vacuum based excision biopsy have reduced almost exclusively the underdiagnosis or misdiagnosis or indeterminate diagnosis before an operation. So we're doing a lot more radiologically and a lot less surgically. So there isn't many circumstances now where we intraoperatively analyze tissue. There was a phase with sentinel node biopsy where we're looking at the nodes during the operation, but even that now has almost gone. So when we talk about the x-ray of the specimen, that was really just the physical, have I removed the target or not? And when there's a wire in there moving around as you pull it, or it's falling out as you do the operation, those, you know, you would spend a lot of time waiting for the x-ray to see whether you'd actually remove the right area or was it close to the edge? These coils now have really taken all of that away because of the coil. The probe is it's like one millimeter. It tells you exactly where you are in millimeters away from the source. So it's 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 very easy to to be precise. Yeah, those um those uh, markers that we can identify outside the patient now have changed the way we manage patients pre-surgically. They're never starved at the time on the day of the operation, being anxious on the day of the operation. And having a wire put in anymore they're done way in advance you can do them months in advance as, as Giles alluded to you can do them pre-treatment for chemotherapy which goes on for six months so they've changed it but also then you know that you're in the center of your lesion when you come back to it when there is no lesion left behind your footprint is smaller so we know that that the surgeon can remove much less tissue obviously leaving a smaller defect it's a much more accurate operation it's better for the patient in all kinds of ways but it's also better for the hospitals and for things like the NHS where they're not having to reoperate because of its excision margins are positive. So that saving alone is enormous to the NHS because of operating time being reduced. Sur surgeons aren't waiting for patients to come up from radiology for work with a wire in, mm -hmm. and the surgeons are able to do one operation instead of two. I mean, Keshra, would you say that in the screening setting, that more, you know, the it, the area of vacuum and, you know, the, the interventional side of it has changed the screening assessment of patients and treatment. We, we now get referred patients already done. You know, yes, sort of, I think you know, that's you know. that's indeed the case. So the point is, and 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 Anne articulated that beautifully, is the point of screening is picking these things up early so that we can minimise the amount of treatment as well as affect the mortality and the morbidity from the treatment. And there is a spectrum of um, and radiology is now getting to a stage, particularly from a screening point of view, where we're picking up 90 plus percent of impalpable 
asymptomatic lesions where we can start to really document and locally stage that breast. So there's the lesion that we call and that, met, that will come back as, as breast cancer. But then we then know that the risk in the rest of that breast has now suddenly gone up by just having that bi first biopsy come back. So we can then locally stage and be confident that we have documented the amount of disease there. Therefore, we get this right operation first time around. The surgeons are absolutely what confident in what we've done and what we need to do and the women and I have to, I can't under I can't sort of under stress this is it is really important for them this is a life-changing diagnosis so to be well informed when they come to you on the day of their surgery is one of the real benefits for what radiology has done mm -hmm. I also wanted to pick up another point that came out in the talk You're, you you talked about atypical lobular hyperplasia and the very long words and this is a set of lesions which are called b3 lesions they're indeterminate and we know now after sort of 30 years of screening that these have an increased risk of having a cancer in the immediate adjacent area but also an increased risk of predictability of cancer in the future moreover when we do have find that cancer it's a it's not one of the more aggressive cancers so it is we are able to offer what we call a vacuum excision, as you rightly said, a diagnostic vacuum yeah. Yeah. procedure. And therefore, we're allowing the lady to have the right, the minimum amount of breast tissue for cosmesis and cycology. We get good on oncology, oncoplastic yeah. treatments, and it is deliverable through you know, uh, an incision under local anaesthetic performed mm. by the radiologist yeah. under x-ray, the size of sort of five millimeters, mm. They have bruising, of course, but when they come to it three months later, it's a very different matter. We've marked the area. So when we screen, when we do their surveillance mammograms coming up, we've got the important thing is we've got their previous imaging. It's digital. It's on our system. We can compare. And it's the subtle changes that we're looking for. And that is all in place. So I actually do think that this is, you know, it's, it's, it's a good time. And we've made such great progress that actually has meaningful outcomes for the ladies. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I absolutely agree, Giles. And so that is the part of screening. There's a lot more than just picking up one area. And I think radiology is, is, is very, very crucial mm. to that. Mm. And it makes life uh, and our confidence better. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Kishra. Um, we've, we've gone a bit over um, our time, but um, do we have time for one last question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have one last one that says um, breast density is not routinely reported upon uh, 2D mammography um, mm. as it is not presently part of the mandatory report. Is there the momentum to introduce the factor as part of the report as it appears to be an integral part of breast care diagnostics? Can I take that, Amal, and it'll it'll come back into so. The momentum is already there. If we look at the Royal College of Radiologists guidelines on how we report, we are expected to sort of the first line is to comment on the background density. But up till now, it's been eyeballing. And, and that's very different to the two computer programs that give us a quantitative and consistent level of breast density so we you will have seen some reports that say fatty moderately dense or very dense or extremely dense that that is the is the old way of us eyeballing and now we've got something better which is the Quantra or the Volcara um, that Amal illustrated in his talk and I think that there is very definitely for us now a movement to be able to do that and, and it can often be an automated and in fact Johanna and I have been texting during this presentation to make sure that that is absolutely nailed and taped for us um, mm. at One Wellbeck as well. So we've, we we know that we're we're, we're going to do that. But it is now I, I you know we sit and talk in screening, and it is now about the fact that that. 10 years ago, I have to be honest, or 20 years ago when I was training, we didn't even say that increased breast density was a risk factor to breast cancer. I think the three of us would say we trained relatively the same time. When ladies asked, we didn't say it was an increased data. We didn't, tend, but we know better now. And the fact is we do know better and we can do better. So that is, so I absolutely agree that the momentum is there, Dr. Oko, and we will be, and it will not just be 
it will be across the board, but one Wellbeck will absolutely lead that and make sure that it is part of the integrated care that we offer. I think we're going to take it a step further, hopefully, with uh, things like further suit um, um, uh, computer aided detection and uh, AI, not just giving us the breast density, which is a risk factor, but an actual independent risk factor, which is beyond even breast density, yeah. which is next to come. Yeah. So this thing is, a, as with every um, imaging modality, there's a moving target here, and we're going to get better and better at it. So we're not only going to be able to talk about breast density, but hopefully in the next year or two, you're going to see presentations which actually give an actual risk based on computer-made detection models, which give a patient an individual risk factor. Mm. And the latest ones that I've seen predict with almost 100% sensitivity that the patient might have a breast cancer at that time that you're not spotting. So that that's coming as well. So that's not very far away. Um, in fact, the technology that we're looking at uh, bringing in and introducing is the next level of ICAD, which we currently have, but the step up, which is going to be demonstrated in um, a, a, a meeting we call RSNA, which is the Radiological so uh, Society of North America. And they're demonstrating this technology and we already are linked in with ICAD and we will be the first unit in the country to be yeah. able to offer that technology. Because we want to offer, sorry to add in, has everybody gone? We just want to offer a personalised visit for those patients. And also advise us to their personalised risk. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Going forward. Yeah. I want to thank you all for your presentations and your um, contribution to the Q&A. Um, thank you to all attendees um, for listening in and for um, your valuable questions. And um, I will leave with um, this thank you slide. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to contact us um, and I, we will pass on the questions to our expert panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for attending um, and we shall see you upon our next webinar.